Hello everyone and welcome back to our class in Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning here in Finance. In this section we want to look at regression trees as yet another method in machine learning for classification. That is, we want to classify customers, we want to classify observations we have um, and maybe even stocks um, in an asset pricing application um, into classes, could be good customers, bad customers, customers who terminate their contract or who are prone to terminate their contract and those who are not. And for this, we want to use regression trees as uh, another method um, in comparison to, for example, the K-nearest neighbors um, model and the support vector machines we've seen in subsection five. So this is um, a section on regression trees. What are trees? Um, Again, just like support vector machines and k-nearest neighbors and many classification models, um, these models can actually be used for classification but also for regression problems. It's simply a matter of changing the response variable from, uh, for example, a binary var variable to a metric one. These trees involve stratifying or segmenting the predictor space into a number of simple box-shaped regions. We've seen this with actually the um, support vector machines and the um, support vector classifier. What happened was that we took the predictor space, um, for example, the three-dimensional space, and we cut it into two halves. So we stratified or segmented the predictor space. And this segmenting of the predictor space is performed based on a set of splitting rules. And these rules can then also be summarized in a tree. So uh, what in the end, what we are doing is um, we are setting up some set of rules um, that decide, well, for example, if you are a smoker, uh, you're a class one. If you're not a smoker, you're a class two. That's later on in one of our applications, a very uh, powerful predictor actually. And you can imagine it's for health. Yeah. So this is what a tree looks like on the right hand side. And it's, um, it's, it corresponds to the segmentation on the left hand side. So you can see we have two um, predictors, X1 and X2. And we are segmenting the predictor space into one, two, three, four, five um, boxes. And what happens is this corresponds to a tree that starts out with X1. If X1 is smaller or equal than T1, that's the cutoff, then um, it yields us boxes one and two. And how do we decide on whether it's a one or two? Well, we say X2 is smaller or equal than T2, then we get to R1, then we are here. If X2 is larger, then we are in R2, and we get this box. If X1 is actually larger than T1, then we are in this area. And then we still need to decide is X1 smaller or equal than actually T3, then it's R3. And if it's larger, then we are in this area. And then we still have to decide on whether it's R4 or R5. And we do this with this cutoff. So it's either R5 or R4. So this is the tree and this is the segmentation. Now, how do we do predictions? Well, for a specific observation, they are typically made by a majority rule. Um, by a majority vote in classification, meaning if it's more than 50%, then it's on the right-hand side. If it's less than 50%, then on the left-hand side. Or by using the mean or mode of the training observations in regression analysis in the region that corresponds to the given observation. And for a given region, the prediction for every observation that falls into this region is, of course, the same. And we get the same prediction. Um, how do we build a tree? Now, in theory, uh, for making predictions, as on the previous slide, the regions could have any shape. We could have selected circles, we could have um, selected rectangles, um, and uh, we could have also said, okay, well, it, it looks like this. And this is one region. This is another one. Uh, this is the third one. And this is the next one. We could have done this. Problem is, of course, this complicates things a lot. So um, for simplicity and ease of interpretation, the predictor space is 
often divided into high dimensional rectangles or boxes. And these boxes are chosen such that the classification error or the squared error of the residuals in regression analysis are minimized. So we have an optimization problem again. Now, if you think about what is possible, then of course, think about this predictor space as maybe an image and the um, boxes as pixels. Well, obviously with a higher definition resolution, obviously uh, you get more pixels, you get more boxes. So it's theoretically, at least it's um, possible to uh, partition the predictor space into an infinite number of boxes. So it's computationally infeasible to consider any possible partition of the feature space, even into a finite number of boxes. But if you increase, um, if you decrease the size of the boxes, if you increase the resolution, uh, you could even get to an infinite number of boxes. So therefore one typically relies on a top down so-called greedy approach that is commonly referred to as recursive binary splitting. So what do you do? It's top down because as we've seen in uh, this slide here, you start at the top, uh, you start um, at the top of the tree where you have all observations and they belong to a single region. So you start with the full sample and then you successively split the full feature space into halves and then you go on top down. And it's greedy because at each step, you don't consider what could be happening at, let's say two levels down. You only consider what is best right now. That's why it's greedy. You, know, you only consider the things uh, at this box and at this step. So it could mean that you're looking for the best feature uh, that can, if you now split, for example, your observations into smokers, non-smokers by majority rule, um, you consider uh, only the best outcome uh, for minimization of the MSE, uh, of the residual uh, squared sum, um, or if you consider um, the classification error at this point, what rule and what feature could minimize um, could get you to the largest minimization of your uh, cost function. That's why it's greedy. And you don't consider what is optimal at this point. And does it make sense to choose a different feature here? If you, for example, say, okay, let's start out with um, age here and consider smoking here. If smoking gives you the best result here, then you start out with smoking and don't, you don't consider the full tree. And um, this is why it's greedy. Now for performing recursive binary splitting, you first select the predictor XJ and the cut of or the cut point S such that the squared errors in regression or the classification error rate in classification are minimized over the resulting regions X, given that XJ is smaller than S and X given that XJ is larger or equal than S. In classification tasks, sometimes you can also use the Gini index or the so-called entropy as a criterion for making the tree splits. And you can see in the footnote, you probably know the Gini coefficient uh, and the entropy is actually defined quite similarly. Um, in this process, all predictors and all possible values for the cut point S are considered. And this process is then repeated in each of the resulting regions as we've seen. You go down the tree and then you make another cut and you look for the best predictor and best cut point to minimize the squared regression errors or the classification error rate further at that level. You don't look one step ahead, but it, um, you do it in a greedy way. This continues until some stopping criterion is met. For example, if you believe the classification rate error has been minimized in a sufficient way. By adding further splits to the tree, by going down further and growing the tree deeper, the squared regression errors or the classification error rate can only decrease or it can stay virtually the same. Problem is that this leads to overfitting. You can add layer after layer to your tree, but as the classification error rate cannot increase, it can only decrease, just like the R squared in regression analysis, the model that you're getting is way too complex. 
So indeed, you should use smaller trees with fewer splits. This might lead to a lower variance and better interpretation at the cost of some minuscule increase in your bias. Now remember the variance bias trade-off. Um, so variance will be lower, but the bias might be a little bit higher. Another possible remedy to overfitting trees is to grow the tree only as long as the reduction in classification or regression error exceeds some threshold. This will lead to smaller trees. And this minimum required reduction can be described by a complexity parameter balancing reductions in classification or regression error against the complexity of the model. And in the application, we will see how this works. We will see that a high value of the complexity parameter leads to more shallow trees, while a low value yields deeper trees. And we will also see how in some instances, if we take the basic models, um, this will actually, if we don't look um, at overfitting, um, the models will not generalize well to new data. We will have huge overfitting. And again, as you might have imagined, the optimal value of the complexity parameter, it's a hyperparameter, is a determined via cross-validation. So this is a tree versus a linear model. Uh, you can see that, for example, on the left-hand side, we have a standard classification, for example, using um, a linear uh, support vector machine. You see, uh, we cut through this um, into uh, the yellow and the green area. And obviously, if we have a linear boundary, uh, using boxes and using a regression tree leads to a large bias. You will see this will lead to a huge classification error. Why? Because this is classified uh, probably wrongly, uh, because the majority is yellow. This is probably classified as green. This will be an error, this, this, and this. Um, why is that? Well, as you can see, um, this, even though we are using linear boxes, um, it might be that this doesn't fit the data well. However, if we have a nonlinear boundary, you can see that using a very simple support vector linear classifier here leads to a huge classification error. Whereas we get an almost, well, actually it is a perfect classification using the regression tree. Yeah, in this case, we have a nonlinear boundary, uh, decision boundary, and uh, the regression tree, although we are using linear uh, boxes, rectangles, this is a perfect classification. So even though we are using linear uh, um, objects, we are using rectangles, it might actually be that the regression tree fits the data much better if we have a nonlinear decision boundary. Now, what are the advantages of trees? They are easy to explain. I don't actually need any uh, uh, formula. Uh, they closely mirror human decision making. We are simply looking for boxes and uh, doing our decisions, making our decisions based on cutoff points. Yeah? Uh, smoker, non-smoker, age, low age, high age. It can be displayed graphically and it hand, can handle qualitative predictors, uh, very simply. Um, smoker, non-smoker, one zero. The disadvantages are that single trees often exhibit an inferior predictive accuracy as compared to, let's say, support vector machines, and they can be very non-robust. So a small change in the data might lead to a completely different tree. So what you can do is you can um, aggregate many trees via methods like bagging, random forests or boosting to improve the predictive performance. And we'll see this um, in our application. So I'll come back to bagging, boosting and random forests in probably two or three videos. So these are the advantages and disadvantages. In, in the next video, we'll have a look at the applications.